52nd annual 52nd annual meeting and uh, this is our second year doing this virtually and we really hope to be back in person next year it's only 33 days until spring it's sunny out and it kind of feels like Hawaii a little bit with the mid 40s temps so you're going to learn uh, a lot uh, today about uh, mainly about our soil health program but really about what we've been up to over the past year and we're just really excited to have you all um, just a few rules of this meeting our, our annual meeting we do to preserve bandwidth we've got the video off um, except for the speakers who will be presenting today the meeting is being recorded so you'll be able to go back and watch it later we'll have it posted on our website and we do um, ask you feel free to use the the chat um, for any of the pro if you have questions about any of the program that you're seeing we do ask you to direct specific program and service questions, however, to our website, and we'll give you some information on that here in the chat in a little bit. So a little bit of what we're gonna be talking about um, today. Traditionally, we do uh, have staff updates by our various staff members here at the Marion County Soil and Water Conservation District. We also have a few board updates. We've got two of our new board members that will be presenting a treasurer's report and board uh, election overview. And then of course, we don't do anything without our partners, both at the local level and state and federal government. And you'll hear from uh, the Natural Resource Conservation Service and the Indiana State Department of Ag on um, what is new with them. And then the, at 4.30, we're gonna do a, a really cool little soil health panel with some local urban growers, and that will be moderated by Kevin Allison our soil health specialist. And finally, make sure you stick around for our door prize giveaway and some closing remarks. We do um, have five prizes to give away. We're gonna do a drawing and have some really cool stuff. So um, I'm gonna just go ahead and launch in to um, my report. Uh, and just uh, in, a, in a broad sense, um, thinking about the various services that our district provides, um, we do a lot of private property uh, drainage assistance, technical assistance one-on-one -on -one for drainage issues or, that residents in Marion County may have with our flat uh, topography here in clay soils. Those, those are um, typically uh, many, and, and this weather and the, wetter, the, the wetter winters have only contributed to that. We also do um, construction erosion sediment uh, control inspections for the city of Indianapolis, both for the city projects and for private uh, development that impacts over an acre. And then the third um, spoke, I guess, is in our wheel is the, the urban soil health program that you'll hear more about. So we are providing um, financial and technical and educational assistance to the residents when it comes to uh, natural resources and particularly um, water resources and, and, and soil. And as I mentioned partners earlier, we don't do anything without our, our various partners. And you'll hear from some of them um, today. And you'll hear some other partners mentioned that aren't presenting today, but have been um, uh, that we've worked with throughout the past year. And a great example of that is uh, some of the workshops that we have done this year. We've done a total of five uh, workshops focused on rain gardens and rain barrels and um, a few stream steward workshops. And um, those, the, the rain barrel and rain garden workshops have been funded by our uh, Clean Water Indiana grant from the Indiana Start State Department of Agriculture. We did the um, rain barrel workshop uh, this summer, or this past summer, and that was in partnership with Reconnecting to Our Waterways, a great um, local watershed group as well as Kepra Institute, who we've, we've never worked with before, and they were phenomenal. There were 25 attendees at that workshop, and all the attendees got to take home uh, rain barrels, which was really great. We also did uh, two rain garden workshops, and on the bottom left, um, the picture that you see there is one that we did in June uh, at the Normandy Barn Rain Garden, and we had uh, a total of um, uh, of 43 participants between the two rain garden workshops that we did. So we did one at Normandy Barn and we did one at Christian Park. And both these properties had 
rain gardens um, that I was able to show the attendees uh, what a mature rain garden looks like, what goes into the siting and the design, the planting, the long-term maintenance uh, of these green infrastructure assets. One of the really cool parts about th these workshops is we were actually able to give away native plants um, grown by Indie Urban Acres as one of our partners. And then we also sourced some from Native Plants Unlimited for our later summer workshops. So we gave out actually over 700 native plants at these two workshops that residents got to take home and put in their yards. We also had some follow-up site visits with um, the attendees of those, of those uh, workshops. We also um, did two stream steward workshops. These were in partnership with Friends of White River, which is a, is a great advocacy group for uh, the White River. And that was funded by our Nina Mason Pulliam Charitable Trust, uh, Partners of the White River, grant. Um, so we had a total of uh, 28 folks that came to those two workshops and learned about how to um, be a better riparian property owner, essentially, and um, how to prevent stream bank erosion and how to be a good steward of um, our riparian areas in Indianapolis. The next step um, for that stream steward uh, program will be a stream steward guide that we're currently working on and that is almost wrapped up. We're really excited about it. It's about 20 pages. It's full spread. Um, just uh, more information um, related to being a better riparian property owner. Uh, we did last year, however, complete the rain garden guide that's pictured on the lower right. And um, we'll put a post to that uh, guide and that resource up in the chat. So um, that really encapsulates a lot of things that were talked about in the workshops. And then lastly, I just wanted to mention another project I'm really proud of was um, some restoration we did along Fall Creek and Barton Park. This was funded through uh, reconnecting to our waterways, as well as a lot of work and, and contributions by the City of Indianapolis Office of Land Stewardship. And we've planted several hundred native trees, shrubs, and plugs in that area. It's essentially near 25th and Capitol, really unique spot um, at the northern end of downtown. And then the picture in the middle you see is actually a tree planting we did with the at the uh, with the Mud Creek Conservancy District. And this was through the Senate Bill 690 that gives 100 trees to state reps and senators. We worked with Senator Kyle Walker up there near um, generally 82nd and Sergeant Road is where the property is. And we put in 100 native hardwoods up there. So I did mention resources earlier. We'll put the rain garden guide in the chat. We also created a new bioswale uh, guide as well. And moving on to our urban conservation program. And unfortunately, Elena Jones, our urban conservationist, is out on maternity leave. But she's been phenomenal this past year. We do um, inspections of uh, construction sites for sediment erosion control um, for city of Annapolis projects and as well as private development that disturbs over an acre. We do that um, through an MOU with the city of Indianapolis. Uh, it's actually an interlocal agreement with the city of Indianapolis and they are an incredible partner for us. They provide most of our budget that does not, that does not come from grants. And I know um, Gail Boydston and Shannon Killian are on from DP, City of Indianapolis DPW, and we work with them almost on an everyday basis, especially lately with um, some of the training that's been needed for the new construction stormwater general permit that IDEM put into effect in December that has a lot of changes for our program and how what we look for on sites when we're um, looking for sediment erosion control related to, to construction, which is, can be um, significant if the dirt's not controlled, but we have a lot of things in place to prevent that from being released into our waterways. We also reviewed uh, stormwater pollution prevention plans as seen there, and then um, providing additional technical support and training for local inspectors at the city, as well as contractors. So, uh, at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Julie Farr, our resource conservationist, and Julie does our private property drainage assistance and is going to talk a little bit on that. Um, hello, I'm trying to figure out how to get my <laughs> video on. Sorry. <laughs> um, 
Well, there we go. There okay, go, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm Julie Farr. I'm with the I'm the resource conservationist for the Soil and Water Conservation District. Um, for over 50 years, one of the main um, focuses that the district has had is to be able to, to provide technical assistance to landowners to help them make um, informed decisions about how to best use and care for their land. Um, this often includes helping people with problems that they have, such as drainage issues, um, erosion problems, um, water quality issues. So this year we assisted over 330 landowners um, that included group projects and assistance to homeowners associations. Um, we are also concerned with encouraging wise land use, um, conversion and development. So we reviewed 97 preliminary plats. And in these reviews, we give information on soil types um, and their, their limitations. Um, we make suggestions for erosion control, um, protecting sensitive areas, um, tree planting and protecting those trees. Um, we also promote incorporating rain gardens and bioswales and native plants into development plans. Um, I would like to encourage you guys to um, visit our website. We have a lot of really good educational information um, on that website. You can sign up for our quarterly newsletters there. You can take a look at um, our annual report there. And you can also contact us through the website um, if you need individual um, assistance or, or have further questions. So uh, please do take, take advantage of that website. That's it. Okay. Thanks very much, Julie. And next up, if I can get my slide to advance, there we go. Uh, next up, we have Kevin Allison, who is our, our soil health specialist, and you'll hear a lot from uh, this evening. Thanks, John. Um, hi, my name is Kevin Allison. I'm the soil health specialist for the Marin County SOCD. Um, so I spend a lot of my time um, trying to give technical assistance to growers and working with growers to help implement um, soil health practices and conservation on their urban farms and um, that we um, cover crops, mulching, um, native plantings around field borders, um, even some of the agronomy like um, uh, nutrient management. So um, just really, really like what I do, like working with our growers here. Um, happy to um, be, yeah, we're happy to be hosting of um, three of them, three local growers for our um, panel this evening. Um, so we also do a lot of educational workshops and on-farm demonstrations. Um, whether that be on local growers farms um, or the, dem the SWC demonstration garden at Eagle Creek. Um, and we also do, um, we're also really involved with the USDA NRCS. Um, um, they're currently taking a, a, a very hard look at um, how to um, enhance um, conservation programs for small scale agriculture. Um, so we are um, yeah, a big part of my job is to is to work with the Indiana State Office um, to to review all the technical standards and um, look at even um, potential payment rates for some of the, the federal programs. Um, so I'm excited to see that developing, um, and I think we're fortunate to be a part of it. It feels it feels like a big thing, and I hope it's going to be beneficial for um, for growers in the near future. Um, so yeah, um, that's that's a big part of the USDA and RCS cooperative agreement that that supports a lot of the work that I do. Um, and of course, special thanks to Clean Water Indiana. Um, we just finished a, um, a three-year grant um, in December, um, the 2019 grant, um, in which we work with farmers and demonstrations and workshops and, and technical assistance. Um, and a um, little bit about partnerships. Again, yeah, always working with um, the NRCS. Um, Purdue Extension is a big part of what we do. Um, I serve on the um, statewide advisory committee and the, the local Marion County Extensions um, advisory committee for urban agriculture. Um, so just they they are in line with what a lot of we, what we do, you know, making side visits and we, we like to tag team things and just keep things pointing in the right direction. Um, and also um, involved with the um, IASWCD, so the Indian Association of Soil and Water Conservation Districts, um, or new urban soil health program, um, who is, which is directed um, now by Ellie Blaine, who you might recall was our soil health um, outreach specialist um, for a long time. So um, happy to be working with them and trying to 
um, yeah, trying to expand conservation in small scale agriculture across the state. Thanks, John. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. And believe it or not, um, for those of you who have been coming to this meeting annually, we, we actually just recently celebrated Kevin's seventh year as a district employee. And it's just hard to believe how quickly that's gone by and the program that he has built. And the, um, just want to point out again, the, the generous support from NRCS uh, through a cooperative agreement we have with them that, that actually goes until the end of 2025. And that was funded through the most recent farm bill and um, funds most of Kevin's uh, salary and, and um, some of the workshop and travel expenses related to his program. So we're, we're extremely fortunate to have that partnership. Um, real quick, and we're gonna hear before we get into the, uh, soil, the soil health panel, we're gonna hear from a couple board members and then um, hear from NRCS and ISDA uh, regarding um, some of the work they're doing. And I apologize that my slides keep getting uh, keep getting frozen there. So as a part of, before I turn it over to Olivia, um, we actually are, are governed uh, at the Soil and Water Conservation District. We're governed by Indiana Code 14-32, which is otherwise known as district law. And that's really the framework that we operate in uh, as a local unit of state government. One of the things that we do uh, as, as a requirement of 14-32 is we give an account of our finances uh, for 2021. And we have a new treasurer. Um, we had a new treasurer that started in 2021, Olivia Speckman, who's one of our new board members. She's just done a fantastic job and I'm going to turn it over to Olivia if she's if she's on uh, just to give an account of our of our finances. Thanks, John. Yes, I'm Olivia Speckman, the uh, treasurer for the Soil and Water Conservation District. I'm just going to present the financial for 2021 to you all. Our uh, total income for the year was three hundred and thirty-eight thousand five hundred and forty-nine. Uh, and four dollars and four cents. Um, our total expenses for the year were um, four hundred three thousand eight hundred twenty-five dollars and forty-three cents. Just trying to be precise. <laughs> um, <laughs> with our uh, net, that left us with a net operating income of negative sixty-five thousand two hundred and seventy-six dollars and thirty-nine cents. And our bank balance at the end of the year was one hundred seventy-four thousand eight hundred twenty-four dollars and fifty-two cents. Um, some of the new grants from um, 2021 were the Clean Water Indiana 2021 grant um, through the Indiana State Department of Agriculture and the Reconnecting to Our Waterways Supplemental Environmental Project grant. Um, our income increased 3% and then our expenses increased 12% compared to the year prior. Uh, most of that is due to um, expenses incurred in quarter four of 2021 that will be reimbursed through the Clean Water uh, Indiana grant in the first quarter of 2022. Um, we also had some one-time employee benefits related expenses um, that account for some of those um, increases in 21. So with that, I'll uh, pass it back to you, John. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much, Olivia. And if I could just add, yeah, we've got um, some expenses. We, we have several grants going on that are on a reimbursement basis. So we had some uh, grant expenses that hit in Q4 21 and that for which we are now submitting claims in Q1 of 2022. So we re get reimbursed for those expenses. So that net operating income loss is, is um, more really almost zeroes out um, once we get that new revenue in at the beginning of this quarter, but really appreciate, um, obviously with inflation having gone up, costs have gone up and um, interest rates of course are, are very low. So you see the effect of that in our, our finances here. Um, next up, I will turn it over to uh, Mr. Tyler Goff, who is the um, farm manager at Indie Urban Acres over on the east side. He's also our uh, one of our, our other new board member that started in 2021. And Tyler uh, headed up the elections committee. Um, we have five 
supervisors on our board and um, two are appointed, three are elected. Those are on three year uh, election cycles. And so there is one elect elected position to be filled uh, in 2020, ugh, 20, 2022. I almost said 2020. <laughs> uh, and Tyler's gonna talk a little bit about the process we'll follow. We're gonna do a virtual election again this year, um, similar to last year. So are you on there, Tyler? I am, thanks, John. Awesome. I am, I'm a, a new member of the Board of Supervisors and promptly um, am now a member of the election committee. So as John said, we do have one uh, elected position coming up this year. And there's a couple of ways that, um, we identify candidates. One is through the election committee. The other one is anybody can nominate anyone to do it. Um, so starting tomorrow, we're gonna open up um, the candidate nominations and that'll be open for a week. After that, we're gonna have a week where um, we can make sure that the people that were nominated actually wanna do it and um, they're qualified and, and, and all of that. And then um, starting Thursday, March 3rd, and it'll be open for a week, we'll be voting. And this has changed. Um, last year was the first year that uh, it wasn't in person at our annual meeting. There's a few different ways that you can vote. Um, one, uh, the forms will be all on uh, marionswcd.org site. So you can vote there. You can print out the forms, uh, fill it out and mail it in. And um, there's actually a very secure drop box at 1200 Madison Avenue that you could drop off um, your ballot there. So that'll be open for a week. It'll be it'll end uh, March 10th at 4 p.m. And then uh, March 15th, we'll um, count the ballots and um, uh, see who wins that position. So if you've uh, ever dreamed of being a part of Marion, County Soil and Water Conservation District or know someone that uh, has had that dream, um, reach out to the district or to me personally and we can walk you through ways to make those dreams come. And I should also note that the, the board members do have to live in Marion County. So make sure that whoever you might propose put forth as a nominee that is a county resident. And those board of supervisors are actually considered public officials of the state of Indiana. So. We have a um, great board, uh, not only with Tyler and Olivia, but also our board chair, Maggie Gagline, uh, who is going to say a few words at the end. And then um, longtime board members, Brian Nielsen and Heather Buck. So um, we're just, we have great strengths on that board um, technically and the work that these board members do in the community. And so next, I would like to turn it over to. Uh, Jared Chu from NRCS, who is our uh, district conservationist and um, a key partner in everything we do. Thank you, John. Uh, glad to be part of the meeting. Uh, am I coming through okay there? You are. Excellent. Um, as John said, uh, I am a district conservationist with the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service, and uh, I just grabbed one small um a sound bite here i guess you would call that from not a sound bite a bit of information from uh, our national uh, information that comes out um where uh i think very applicable to marion county um usda continues to to put resources towards urban agriculture um in this case um, you can see that uh, Indiana has recently received over 2.4 million in non-federal partnership match, um, specifically uh, moving towards urban agriculture. So just thought that was very uh, poignant that uh, that's what we work on a lot here in Marion County. Um, matter of fact, there's a, a beautiful picture of Sharana Moore, if you all know her uh, at Lawrence Community Gardens, uh, just, uh, hanging out in the high tunnel that uh, that we, we helped out with up there on the east side. Um, we do that kind of work with uh, several farmers and, and gardeners and, uh, and, and all different scales. We also get involved in, in traditional large-scale farming as well, uh, erosion control, 
water quality, wildlife pollinators, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, certainly one of the practices that uh, is very needed and gaining a lot of interest and in ground is, is controlling invasive species in Indiana. So I just grabbed that picture just to remind myself to mention that uh, tonight. Um, that's one of the things actually in, in 2021 um, through our environmental quality incentive program, we did help uh, cost share on 18 acres of brush management and we continue to get more applications in to do that kind of work and certainly have several um, just visits with landowners throughout the year to talk about invasive species control, um, as well as, um, as I mentioned, lots of things like pollinator plantings. Um, Kevin mentioned a lot of things in regards to soil health practices. So we get involved in a lot of that kind of work as well. Um, even livestock um, practices from watering systems to, um, you know, safely, uh, having areas where they congregate. So um, thanks for the opportunity to come here and speak a little bit about what NRCS does. Uh, certainly uh, Marion County SWC has some great things going for it and we're glad to be partners. Thanks, John. Thanks very much, Jared. And our, our last partner uh, speaker before we get into the soil health panel is Geneva Tyler, who's our district support specialist for the Indiana State Department of Agriculture, Agriculture and we do uh, a lot of work with them as well. So let me um, get your slides up there. Geneva, are you, are you with us? I am, thank you, awesome. John. Yeah, thank thanks, for, uh, thanks for giving me a couple minutes. Um, like John said, I'm Geneva Tyler with the State Department of Agriculture. I just wanted to highlight a couple programs that we have going on, the Clean Water Indiana, fund is administered by the State Soil Conservation Board and the Indiana State Department of Agriculture, as was mentioned before. And this money comes from, um, it's funded by the cigarette taxes um, and it is provided for conservation efforts. And in this last fall, we had a total of just over $1.6 million asks in, um, in proposals. There were 18 proposals and the State Soil Conservation Board awarded 13 of those, one of which was Marion County. So congratulations, Marion County, for your award. Um, it was mentioned earlier, but I just wanted to kind of show you the map and see, so you could see the distribution of the, the various districts and the various projects that were awarded. Um, next slide, please. And then I also wanted to touch on, um, last year I, I mentioned the uh, USDA Risk Management Agencies, um, pandemic cover crop program. And last year, Marion County was not a part of that, um, unfortunately. However, it was just announced on February 11th that they have expanded. And so in order to complement the, <coughs> excuse me, the pandemic cover crop program and get more participation, uh, the State Department of Agriculture and the Nature Conservancy have decided to reopen the sign-up period for the cover crop premium discount program to mirror the pandemic cover crop program. And so um, they have expanded the coverage to six counties, Boone, Hancock, Hendricks, Johnson, Marion, and Morgan. And this is a $5 per acre incentive uh, program on 2022 cover crop insurance for producers who plan to cover crops in the shaded area that you see on the map. Um, the cover crops enrolled in the program may not be enrolled in other federal or state programs such as EQIP or CWI. Um, applications are to be submitted online and they are due March 15th. So uh, in just under uh, about a month from now. Um, and then once uh, those are due or once those are submitted, then Indiana State Department of Agriculture will field verify 10% of the acres that are eligible. So I want to give you a heads up on that program that's um, being rolled out or expanded, I guess. Um, it's not completely new, so um, there's probably been some press releases and so forth that's gone out. So um, that's all I have. Great. Thank you very much, Geneva. And for, for our um, Marion County's Clean Water Indiana 2022 award, 
we're actually partnering with Purdue Extension and reconnecting to our waterways again to offer uh, a few two day rainscaping pro uh, uh, workshops. And those will be focused on um, really intensive deep dive dive on, on rain gardens here locally. So that's gonna be really exciting. So actually, we're we're right on time, 4:30 for the uh, soil health panel. And at this point, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And um, please just bear with us here as as we get settled. We've got um, panel participants uh, sort of spread out across town in different locations, and we're also um, juggling loading up uh, multiple presentations and technologies. So. Um, if your screen freezes or something goes haywire, just bear with us and, and hang out a little bit. But at, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to our soil health specialist, Kevin Allison. Take, take it away, Kevin. Good. Um, yeah, so um, thanks for joining us tonight. And um, this is going to be a, a, a brief, um, unfortunately, look at... Um, a few of the farms. Um, I'd love to give them each an, and I'd love to each hear each of these farms talk hours about <laughs> about what they do. Um, that's why I'm so fortunate to have the job that I do because I get to go out and visit with them and see see it in person. So hopefully this gives you a, a glimpse of, of what some of them are doing. And um, at the end, um, feel free to, well, through the, throughout the presentation, feel free to um, put questions in the chat and we can have a, a question and answer after um, the three are finished presenting. Um, so with that, um, I'm going to ask Amy Matthews to get us started, and then we've got Danielle from the Soul Food Project and Tim Dorsey at the farm at Butler University. Thank you, Kevin. Um, do you have my slides on there? Should I? Um, I'll just start advancing. There we go. Can you see that okay? Okay, all good. Okay, hey, thanks for having me. Um, my name is Amy Matthews, um, part of Mad Farmers Collective, um, which is located on the south side of Indianapolis, um, two miles south of the circle. Um, I am just going to give you kind of an overview of our farm um, and then talk a little bit about our soil health practices specifically. Um, so go ahead, Kevin. Next one, real briefly, my history. Um, I show you this just to, um, I guess, outline two things. One, I've kind of bounced back and forth between urban and rural um, during my farming life. And then the other thing um, is that I don't have any formal training in farming. And I think that's not atypical of farmers these days. Um, I wish there were more training programs at universities and apprenticeships and things like that, but um, I have not. So I've been back in Indianapolis um, 12 years now. Um, all of that time developing um, this farm on the south side. Um, next one, Kevin. So like I said, I'll um, give you a snapshot of our farm, kind of where we are, who we are now. Um, I am gonna um, take a couple slides to walk through our, our farm site development because it pertains to soil health and it's um, very unique to an, an urban setting. So we'll, we'll go through that. And then I, I'll talk to you a little bit about our soil health practices. Okay, next one. Um, so our farm today, um, we started out as two separate farms, Big City Farm and South Circle Farm, um, merged, I guess, six, seven-ish years ago to create Mad Farmers Collective with another grower. Um, the land we currently grow on is leased from a nonprofit organization, so we don't own this land. Um, and it's about an acre and a half in production. Um, so there's two of us farmers who are full-time partners, um, one um, part-time year-round staff, and then four part-time seasonal staff who are um, just starting for the season um, this week and next week. Um, so that's kind of our whole team. Our products, um, we grow lots of different kinds of fresh produce. There's lots of things we don't grow because we are small. We focus on salad greens, tomatoes, roots, um, cooking greens, and herbs. We do a lot of transplants and home garden supplies, and we're increasing that kind of year by year, that part of our, the nursery part of our practice. We grow with organic practices and we're a four season farm. Um, our sales outlets, like I mentioned, we're a small business. So um, after 
I'll talk about this. We had some initial grants to get the site set up, but we operate with our own revenue, I guess, just as any small um, family farm or small business does. So our sales outlets, um, we started an online store two years ago when the pandemic started. So we're keeping that going. So folks pick up at the farm, uh, summer farmers market, and then we sell to several local businesses. So restaurants and small grocers. And, um, you know, this has evolved over the years. We did a CSA for our first few years. We did, um, we've had an on-site market stand from time to time. We've done winter farmers markets. So we've done a lot of different things, um, but this is, this is kind of where we are now. And the next one, um, I want to show you these, these slides, these photos of how our farm um, developed the actual land. Um, like I said, it's very different from uh, how you would do almost any other, <laughs> any other farm. So in, in 2011, when I started um, working on the site, it was a vacant lot. The nonprofit that owned it had done um, all the uh, soil health testing to check uh, for past uses and contaminants. And there were several pockets of high lead on different parts of the site. So rather than adding organic matter and tilling it in and, and doing it that way, um, I decided to build up on the site. So we started depositing wood chips that we got free from you know, um, tree trimming companies. And for several months, actually it took, um, took two years to develop most of the site and then two or three more to really kind of finish it out. Um, so anyway, it's very labor intensive. We brought tons of wood chips on site and built the site up um, 18 to 24 inches in wood chips. You can see it kind of being spread out there. Most of it was done by wheelbarrow and human power, but um, we did have a little tractor help for some, um, for some so next slide. Um, we had, um, like I said, an initial grant to bring in a lot of soil. So we actually built plot by plot around the acre and a half, um, roughly 100 by 100 or so, or 100 by 50 plots, um, no, 50 by 50 plots um, across the site. And so it was just kind of a process over time. Like I said, those first two years, we really got most of the site built out and started growing on it right away. So, um, you know, the soil we got from a farm on the south side, um, just like I guess any soil you'd buy from the local companies, they were um, mining it off, I think, to do gravel um, beneath it. So, mining that off the land and brought it downtown. So, very strange. So, pretty much after that, we're able to to um, farm it as you would care of any soil. A few quirks though that I'll show you. Um, next slide. So that just kind of shows you that first year, um, some of the development that we're able to get done um, in, in building up on the site. So essentially building the site as a raised bed. Um, okay, next slide. Um, and then just to point out with this method of, of building a farm, um, the kind of initial site building was the first one to three years, but we continually replenish the wood chips and kind of um, still surprises me 12 years later that it, it still requires quite a lot, not as much as before, but we still do that. So all the pathways, all the edges, um, we do that. Um, and then, you know, just adding the um, regular infrastructure that small farms need. So you can see a lot of different kinds of, of tunnels in this picture. Um, the one that we're building there in 2017 um, was through the EQIP program. So worked with Jared and Kevin on that. Um, next slide, you'll see, oops, we missed one. Um, but anyway, I, um, the next picture was of just the site today or last year as it was. So everything's in place, the tunnels are up and we're growing. Um, and I'll show you some of the soil health practices we're using to grow these crops. So this is just a snapshot of some of our things. Um, growing practices, I mentioned that we grow organically. So there's a lot of um, management at about every step of the way. You can see on the bottom there for, um, Pest control, we have netting on the top there, sticky traps. We use 
every kind of pest control you can imagine. We start with, um, you know, row covers and nets to keep things out, but um, we do all the other things um, that you need to do an organic farm. So uh, developing an ever widening toolbox of, of ways we combat pests. We do have a lot in the city. You might be surprised um, that there's plenty here. Um, intensive production, two to three crops per bed per year. And that presents its own set of, um, I don't know, management decisions in terms of keeping the soil healthy for that. Uh, we are year round, um, wide variety of crops you can see in that picture. Um, yeah, so let's see, next slide. <clears throat> so some of the soil health things are what you would expect of a one, one to two acre farm. We use permanent beds. We use, we do use compost. Um, uh, we try to do that as needed or carefully because um, to not get nutrients out of whack, but we've used um, leaf compost from Beach Grove, um, our farm compost. We purchased some from um, mostly Green Cycle, but some others. Um, so it's, I feel like um, we have trouble accessing really high quality compost, but um, we don't need as much as we used to now that our beds are healthier. We do use organic fertilizer and some fertigation for tomatoes and peppers and other long season crops, that's important. Um, and we don't use a lot of cover crops on our farm. We, we, we crop pretty intensively. So I think um, last winter about 15 beds got into cover crop for winter, but we do do the leaf mulch over the beds. We use crop mulch. Um, uncomposted leaves as well. So we get the beds covered for the winter as well as you know crop, um, crops growing in them over the winter. Okay, next slide. Um, other practices, so you can see the soil covered on the left with um, landscape fabric and on the right, some interplanting in the tunnels. So things are growing in the beds um, most, of, most of the year. Um, next slide. So I mentioned we do, you know, grow pretty intensively. So um, one of the things um, we've developed to not till the beds, we don't, we don't till, we use the tilther, you can see on that right, on the left side of that right photo, we use the tilther on beds, not, not at every replanting, but if we're replanting greens or carrots or something. So anyway, we usually mow crops down with a weed eater and then tarp them to kind of break down the the crop residue and the roots, and then um, we can replant them um, bare, in, a, in a low to no-till way um, and still get several crops. And we also do a lot of rotations and long season versus short season crops, different plant families and all that kind of stuff as well. So you can see we do use the broad fork um, and the tilt for our bed prep. Okay, next slide shows some things that um, We've interacted with NRCS and um, soil and water on. So um, several workshops over the years, especially trying to learn more about native plants and pollinators and great rain garden workshop last fall. And so things like that, um, a lot of the nutrient management workshops Kevin's done, we've been able to attend. We've been able to host some as well with um, these guys. Um, we did a cost share for native planting, the soil health demo with Kevin for the past couple of years. And then obviously the tunnel there um, with Equip. So a um, lot of ways that um, these programs have really helped us. And it's also just great to have a resource, you know. So sometimes we don't maybe fall in even to the technical assistance bucket when we're just calling, you know, for one-off questions here and there. But um, it's it's just been a really great resource for us as we've as we've grown over the years. So we're so grateful, um, you know, for. Kevin and Jared and, and other staff that we've been interacted with at Soil and Water Foundation. Um, so I think that's the end of my slides for now. Um, I don't know if we're doing questions now or probably at the end of them. So anyway, thanks for thanks for listening a little bit about um, about our farm. Thank you, Amy. Um, awesome. Um, yeah, we'll we can save. Yeah, I see a few questions in there, um, but we can save those towards the end. Um, yeah, keep them coming if you'd like. <laughs> um, so next up is Danielle. Danielle. Um, from Soul Food Project. Um, let me get her unmuted.
One second, please. Should be able to now, Daniel. Sorry about that. Oh, perfect. Okay. <laughs> Hi everyone, um, I'm Danielle. Um, like Kevin said, I am the founder and executive director of Soul Food Project. Hi Amy. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I founded Soul Food Project um, in 2017. I also didn't have any like professional farming experience. I just saw a need in our community and decided to start a farm. I have been volunteering at community gardens beforehand, but then I kind of just said, hey, we're in a food desert. Let's start a farm and start growing food. And so I founded it in 2017. And Kevin, go next slide, actually. Um, yeah, so sorry, it's really bright. Um, our mission is to foster wellness in our community by increasing access to local food, offering hands-on education, and giving space to local artists. So we are a nonprofit urban farm. And so we have really very our two biggest goals are increasing access to food in our neighborhood on the northeast side of Indianapolis, which is a food desert, and offering offering hands-on educational um, workshops to this community. So we sell at our farm stand. We have a CSA, and we um, sell to wholesale accounts. So we are part of the Indianapolis um, Seed to Store program, where we sell to local grocery stores as well. And that's kind of where we, a lot of our revenue comes from, along with our grants. And then for educational programming, we have a youth program called Youth Grow Indy. So in the summers, well, actually, it's a year-round program now. So from, we hire about 10 students from around the high schools in the area to come work on the farm with us and learn about farming, food justice, um, employment, financial literacy, all those different things. And we also do like monthly, work, monthly workshops at our farm as well for neighborhood neighbors, teaching them about how to homestead, how to grow their own food, things like that. And we're really interested in, into like food sovereignty and food justice in the neighborhood. So we are food desert. We want our neighbors to have the power as well to grow their own food. Um, so now I'm kind of gonna go more into our soil health our soil health work because we do a lot of work that way. So this is our first site, um, Temple Avenue. This is the site in 2017. I took over this site. It was a overgrown, non-used community garden. And like 12 wooden raised beds, the archway there, and the soil was really bad. The soil in that was, um, I think they got soil from like the city and from like old, like a, there's a field from the field, dirt field. So it was just like old, like clay and compact soil. Um, it wasn't really great soil. It was very compact, hard to work with. And so I really needed to figure out a way. So in partnership with, with Amy and Kevin actually, we started doing lasagna garden style beds. You know, next slide, Kevin. And so what lasagna style beds are where we mulch the, I took off those raised beds, I mulch the entire um, site, um, and then I put down um, paper, newspaper rolls, and then we did straw. And then we did, uh, we added in like beer green, like spent beer green, some blood meal and apart that, uh, blood meal and um, alfalfa meal. And then we added compost and then we laid, layered that up like three different times to get to how we are on the right picture where the, they're like five, 10, um, 30 foot beds that are growing style that way. So that's what we did for this site. It was a site that helped give us a lot better soil content texture out there and a lot healthier beds and the beds are still growing. That was, that picture is actually from, I believe this summer of 2019. And so that's how it looks now. And it still looks that way as well. Like I still have the mulch each pathway throughout the, um, each year. And I still add some, a little bit of compost, but the soil in this, um, these beds now are really great. So we, we pretty much made our own soil and let, let them break down over the winter time. So I kind of built my own soil up for this site. And that was a really great experiment for our other sites as well. Cause I actually, I didn't mention this, but I have three sites. So <laughs> I am in the city and but I farm three different sites in the city. And so on the next slide, site, slide, sorry. Yeah, this is our third site. Um, this is an apartment complex on the far east side. And they actually built the garden already and they kind of just needed something to come in it. And so the, 
before they had like all grass around the beds I added in all the mulch and then I've been helping to like amend these beds as well helping them build, build it up they actually actually had a lot of good soil already out, out at this site so this site really has been a lot more of just maintaining the soil and how good it is and like testing it each year and helping fig figuring out how to make it keep it really going really well because it was already really good soil already that they have brought in so they had paid for high quality soil for their garden and so this site has been kind of like my baby site where I used to like my goal for my other two sites to get to because they are again, again the soil over here is really good um but these two sites were I farmed those in 2017 through 2019 and then in the fall of 2020 I was given a third site which has kind of helped me take all the lessons I've learned from these two sites and put into this third site. So next slide. So our third site is our Sheldon Street build out that we have. And um, it is three sites in a residential neighborhood in Martindale, Brightwood, Indianapolis neighborhood. Um, and it's about a third of an acre combined. And there's three sites controlled combined. And then you can see the middle with the cone is, there's like cement in the middle because we, from research, um, there's lead in this soil. And so we believe the EPA like capped that middle site to help contain the lead because it was really high, but they, they didn't cap the other two sides, other two sides of it, because they're technically three separate properties. So there is lead in these so in this soil. So to help us work to help me figure this out, I as you can see, I started adding mulch over all the grass. And so we started in 2020. It's still happening right now. I'm still doing this. I'm still spreading mulch over all this, all this entire third of an acre. I'm mulching all of it, um, but I'm also using the lasagna style beds as well, so in a way. So I'm starting with the paper and adding in the straw and then adding in um, the compost and like and like fertilizer on top of that and building up for the um, for the beds. And so that's that's our practice on this site because we, I wanna keep the lead in place and I don't wanna disturb it at all. And so like Amy did, I'm building up as much as possible for our growing practices at this site. And the next slide. And so here is the site um, this past summer. Um, we ha it's now, one side is already, already fully built out with 22 long um, beds going on across the side, fully mulched and everything. And I'm still like, again, I'm mulching pathways still as well. So I always mulch, I'm constantly mulching over there and getting everything, making sure it stays mulched and adding wool chips to all the pathways and to some of the beds. And we do cover crops as well on this site. Um, next slide. And also, so some of our soil practices that we do, um, in the fall, I, for, I did half of my beds are covered and usually cover crops, usually do peas and oats. I'll admit I'm pretty lazy. So like a winter kill cover crop is like the best thing for me because I don't have to worry about it in the spring. Um, so I usually do peas and oats for my cover crops in the fall and then I also put leaves on the bed so I don't get to for cover cropping because I don't always get to all of them. And so those are my pretty, what I, my strategies that way. And I also try to um, craft this no-till, low-till. I'm similar to Amy in that I have a tilder and I have the broad fork and I use um, silage tarps to cover and, that, and cover things that way as well. And I, but I do also amend with compost. Um, we're still only a year, sometimes a year, two, year three for the soil. So I still add um, compost to a lot of my beds in the, in the fall, in the spring. Um, I get it from Green Cycle. My goal is to eventually have our own compost at site to produce, but there's so many sites and so large of a site that from different sides of the town that moving it that way is a little struggle for us, but um, that is our goal. And yeah, that is a soul food project and our soil health um, practices. Thank you, Dania. Awesome. You. <laughs> All right, cool. I am going to switch my screen real quick, so bear with me. And then we'll have Tim up. Tim, are you here with us? I'm with you. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks for coming on, Tim. Um, so, Tim, we're just going to let the um, slideshow kind of run in the background, and Tim's going to give you a, um, a rundown of his farm. Um, good to see you. Thanks for having me. 
Um, I'm Tim Dorsey. Kevin was kind enough to put those photos on for me. I'm not yet familiar with this brand new technology of uh, PowerPoint. So hopefully they don't go too fast. Um, I'm the farm manager of the farm at Butler. We are a one acre um, agriculture project uh, initiative of the Center for Urban Ecology and Sustainability here at Butler. Um, we've always been in the academic side of the university as opposed to like the operational side. Uh, and we've reached, recently moved um, right under the provost's office. So we'll be reporting that way. Um, and the, the center or the cues as it's known has its hands in a lot of different initiatives, uh, but the farm is one of the more visible, uh, certainly on campus. Um, I would say we're aiming to demonstrate um, food production just in the context of conservation and ecological enhancement of our space. Um, we are aiming for a really rich diversity, both in terms of what we're growing here, but also in what we're inviting to the space in terms of um, you know, the insect and animal life. Um, we're seeking uh, to find ecological balance, um, uh, especially in terms of harnessing those uh, services for, for the production of crops. Um, we're working on soil protection, soil health, carbon storage, water protection. Um, and we try to achieve these through reduced tillage that's in recent years reduced almost to zero for us. Um, through crop rotations, we, our annual vegetables go through a 10-year uh, crop rotation. So nothing's coming back to the same spot for about 10 years and nothing in the same plant family for three or four years. Um, we use a bunch of organic mulches, um, leave plant residue on the beds when we can. Um, we don't use as many cover crops as I wish we did. I'm always talking with Kevin about that, um, but we do regularly use cover crops, mostly uh, winter kill, uh, as Danielle men mentioned, oats, radish, pea. Um, in the summer, we'll use some buckwheat. Um, and would like to experiment with some cow peas um, and then an occasional um, uh, winter hardy cover crop as well. And we would deal with that um, usually with uh, sickle and then probably silage tarp over the residue uh, to kill any regrowth. Kevin's been kind enough to help me with the sickling work from time to time. Um, we use drip irrigation. Um, the, the space is really, a lot of the space is dedicated um, to habitat uh, for pollinators, uh, habitat and, and food for the pollinators. Um, and a lot of our space is dedicated to perennial plants as well. Uh, only about a third of an acre, uh, certainly no more than 40% of an acre is actually dedicated to the permanent beds where the annual vegetables uh, rotate through. Um, so we have a lot of uh, space um, uh, in various perennial plants, up to small trees, uh, shrubs, uh, vegetative native plants, um, you know, ground cover plants. Um, always, always uh, looking for a great diversity of plants. Uh, included in those are a lot of native plants as well. Um, we would, in terms of uh, pests, we would use pest exclusion, um, and but really we're looking as much as possible to harness those ecological services from all the critters that we're attracting to the space. We're also blessed to be right next to a, kind of a partially managed prairie uh, restoration project on campus and located also next to kind of some riparian uh, wooded areas. We're, we're located in what's known as West Campus between the White River and uh, the Indianapolis uh, Central Canal. Um, yeah, I mentioned the cover crops. Uh, we've recently gone through a shift in terms of how we market the produce that we grow. Um, over, we're about 11 or 12 years into the project and we utilized a CSA and an on-site farm stand uh, for many years, including, and then also uh, restaurant sales. Um, the pandemic kind of threw us off that and, and possibly a happy accident. Um, we weren't able to continue easily with some of those um, sales methods. Uh, and um, 
we've we're now uh butler has a new dining partner that's been here a couple years uh now and they're much more interested in uh local purchasing and their contract with the university also requires uh, a fair amount of local purchasing as well so we're only about really one year into that arrangement so knock on wood that's going really well from our perspective um, hopefully they'll keep wanting what we are growing for them um uh yeah so they, they they've been pretty responsive to uh the various things that uh we will bring up to them and just kind of adjust um their menus accordingly um we have a lot of student involvement uh, through a few different programs, an internship program, uh, another program called our farm liaisons. So we have students directly working on the farm. We also um, really just serve as a facilitator for a lot of different kinds of educational opportunities, whether it's uh, classes um, from the university visiting to discuss different topics in uh, food systems, sustainability, uh, you know, more hard sciences, biological, uh, you know, soil concerns. Uh, we also have outside groups. We always host a tour from the FFA conference each year. Um, and I'm just noticing a lot of the slides go by. Yeah, I mentioned, you know, less than 40% is devoted to annuals and uh, the most of the rest of the space is devoted to perennials. And when possible, we're choosing plants that will also provide uh, crops. So we have a lot of fruits. We have, uh, including some unusual fruits. We even have some hazelnuts on the farm. Um, yeah, so it's pretty diversified. I was going to mention one project that we worked uh, uh, specifically with SWCD on several years ago. There was a cost share program, and we were able to harness some funds to develop space around, uh, we call it the dome here. It's just a uh, covered uh, shade area where we do our uh, washing and, and uh, uh, some of the packing. Uh, and we started to collect our rinse water and send it into a small rain garden. And also around that area added a bunch of uh, windbreak evergreens, some uh, native arborvitae, um, and also some food producing uh, uh, fruits uh, and a whole bunch of different native plants due to the wet soil from the rain garden. So we were able to diversify even more because of that sort of um, water collection in that area. Um, and so we were able to work with SWCD and uh, use some funds to, to buy native plants for that project. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's it. Thank you, Tim. Great. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm going to stop sharing. Um, those are beautiful pictures, Tim. <laughs> awesome. Um, so yeah, I guess we can we can just kind of roll into a little question and answer. Um, so honestly, if you've got yeah, if you got any questions about um, to these growers, you, you've you've got them. You got them now. So <laughs> go ahead and um, put your answers in chat. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start with um, go ahead and start with Titus. Um, did, did Amy? Did you mention fertigation? Um, so, a technical question: What is fertigation? I did mention it. Yeah, um, just it just means sending fertilizer through um, your irrigation system. Thus, fertigation. So, it's just one of the ways where we manage nutrients for the specific crop that we're growing because we grow a lot of different kinds of crops and pretty intensively we have to really pay attention to what we apply and so for things like tomatoes that might be in there for producing for several months at a time we do give them a boost through fertigation ideally the nutrients come through the uh, soil but in certain cases we have to supplement that so for tomatoes, we supply extra um, nitrogen a little bit, but mostly looking at potassium through the irrigation system. Awesome. Amy, are those like um, are those like soluble like powder? Like is it like a powder product almost that you that you mix um, and then put in? Like how's that how's that practically look? That's yeah, that's an option. The one we use um, we use like a 
fish fish and seaweed based one and then the um the potassium is a liquid when we get it so it's like 006 it's pretty pretty low dose but you can get um organic uh granulars that will dissolve definitely get not organic uh fertilizers that dissolve um but it's pretty common practice for greenhouses we mostly just use it in um, some of our tunnels cool thank you um hope that answered your question titus um so rick you ask um what happens to your vegetables after harvest i think i think everybody kind of explained um where, where they ended up going so i think you asked that question right before um, the first presenter started started diving into that too so um, if you have a follow-up just you go ahead and put it in the chat again if, if i need to clarify anything um okay yeah i'm just gonna go through them okay i had a weird problem this year um for five years my various lettuce plants self-seeded year after year um reliably um last year they were sterile all of a sudden does anybody have any ideas on what could happen Uh, I'd like to hear more about what is meant by they were sterile, uh, you know, if they actually produced seed or what, but I, I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, cool. Um, Titus, yeah, um, send me an email and we can, we can look into it. <laughs> um, okay, does, um, do any of you use, um, yeah, you talked a little about wood chips. I think um, there was a kind of a follow-up question on, on wood chips, like, um, I know Danielle, you use them a lot. Um, do you, do you, I guess, well, to any of you, like, do you, does anybody like take wood chips and like start compost piles with them? Um, does anybody use them in, in your walkways um, versus your growing beds? Um, yeah, kind of how's, how's that look on your farms? Amy, have you ever used wood chips? <laughs> uh, just on our farm, we do use, uh, some certainly not at that scale. Uh, usually, we would use them when we're preparing like a new uh, or maintaining a, a bed of perennial plants. That's typically we, how we use them. I have composted uh, wood chips just by themselves, and it um, can make a very nice looking compost. I've only gone ahead and applied it around woody plants just because it seemed like that probably wouldn't be balanced. Um, so well for vegetables and, and vegetative plants as much, but um, that's how that's how we use them. A much less scale than the other, uh, cool. Amy and Danielle, I think. Yeah, we used them as the base for our entire acre and a half, so that is a lot. So yeah, they've composted down there. They're they're very nice, um, but right now we just use them like not in bed pathways, but around plots. Um, and then around edges of the farm. I would not use them. I probably wouldn't use them in a compost on purpose because they take so long to break down. And then I certainly wouldn't use them like as a mulch for vegetables or in vegetable beds because they'll tie up so much nitrogen and take forever to break down. Um, but yeah, I use them for, like Tim said, perennial um, mulchings or something. They're just a good resource because they're free and dealing with some of the contamination issues that a lot of us have, like Danielle and I, that they're just a really good buffer and a free organic material. Anything else, Danielle? Nope, yeah, I use the same way. I do them in the walkways around the beds as well. We have a lot of issue with like morning glory at our site. So I am really been just very adamant about making deep burying that morning glory as much as possible to block off the light. Um, so, but yeah, I use it for that. And we're building some wooden raised beds and so we, they're, really, they're pretty deep, so I use a lot of wood chips at the bottom of those to like, I said that level up a little bit more. So maybe at, we're putting less soil into those raised beds, those wooden beds. And yeah, that's that's one one problem we found is that perennial weeds tend to find their way through the mulch, through the wood chips, a foot, yeah. two feet, three feet. They don't care. Um, so it, you know, it's not great in some ways for that, but you know. It's, it's something that we'll have to deal with um, as part of the beauty and tragedy of relying on lots of witches. Yeah. They're fun to climb on when you have a big pile, though. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, 
have any of you used um, biochar? Um, I don't recall. I don't recall any that any of you have. I don't think. Um, yeah, got a, We had a question about that. Um, Nick, if you if you want to follow up with me, I think there there was a farm, um, Dan Perkins' farm up in north. I think a little bit farther north, maybe an hour north of us. Um, he did some trials, kind of in junction maybe with Purdue, um, about biochar. So there might be some information about that and just maybe personal Indiana grower experience, which is even more helpful. Um, that study was done by several farms, including Full Hand Farm too. So you might check in with them. I forget who the lead on the study was, but we can tell you. Um, yeah, and I, can, I, I know I read it. I can't remember the, the results. I, 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 before speaking about it, I probably want to review it <laughs> to make sure I, I told you the right thing. Um, but yeah, we can we can look for that info for you, Nick. Um, okay, can somebody um, speak to any experience using cinder blocks to build raised beds? Um, potential issues. Yeah, I. Our third site on a party site has center blocks and some of our raised beds. They were put there before I arrived. And so I kind of just had to like accept it in a way. Um, so the ones that have, I try to make sure they don't have any paint on them. First off, like that is separate. My first thing was make sure there's no paint on them. Cause they were from old houses probably. So they're probably letting that paint. Um, but I just put non edibles in those beds that have center blocks, just be on the safe side. So the ones that we have are always just flowers and things like that, that you're just making look pretty and like attract pollinators that way as well, instead of using edible food, just be on the safe side. Um, I'm probably testing that soil this year, actually, I'll check it to see if there have any, if things leached into the soil from the center blocks. So I could let you know um, in a couple months <laughs> once I check that soil and test it. But yeah, as of right now, I haven't had issues with it. Everything grows really well in those beds and nothing's like damaged from having center blocks as the wall. Just, yeah, just be careful about what's actually the, what they were used for, but they were like brand new center blocks. I think they should, they could be fine, but the ones that are used that are like, you should be concerned about. Yeah, I mean, while I haven't done it um, personally, I think, yes, if they're clean, that should be fine. Um, you already have with a raised bed the, the need to stay after it a little bit in terms of the soil um, drying out more easily since it's raised and I, I wonder if the cinder blocks heating up and absorbing the sun's heat could cause that to go even a little more quickly. So just something to consider maybe. Great. Um, yeah, and I might add too that um, a couple more really good resources locally on that um, would be Falega Highwatt. Um, so Esther, um, she she has a, a community center with a attached farm um, and a lot of a lot of their um, a lot of their beds were built in that manner. Um, and then Chris Larson, I believe is here on the call. I about just asked him to start talking about it too, but um, <laughs> um, I won't surprise you, Chris. Um, but um, he's, you know, I think he works, he, he works at Paramount's, um, Paramount School of Excellence, um, Brookside, I believe. And um, they did, um, yeah, he's got a lot of experience in helping Esther um, complete, yeah, kind of thinking through that as well. So those might be two resources on cinder blocks and using cement for brace beds. Okay, um, I saw the movie Kiss the Ground about regenerative farming practices like these to help us turn climate change around. Um, how can I support to get, um, how can I support this as a citizen? Um, how can we get more of our community involved around this? So for example, um, is there a way to host the film? Maybe part of the Heartland or other community support event like that and include a showcase of local Indiana growers that, that can support. Um, Thanks for the good idea. <laughs> um, yeah, the SBC, we, um, we've, you know, we've had, um, especially when we were meeting more in person, um, hopefully those aren't the good old days and hopefully we can do that again. Um, but, you know, we, we would have grower workshops and um, even did a film. Um, and after the film, we had a, a panel of permaculture, perm, local permaculture folk, folks. So we'd love to do that in the future. <laughs> um, so yes. Um, and as far as like getting, um, you know, community involved around um, our mission and, and these farms. Um, yeah, I think I would just think, you know, maybe reach out to the farms and, and just, um, you know, support them at farmers markets. Um, I'm sure the growers could speak more to that as well. Um, and, and then just the SWCD, you know, just get on our, our news, make sure you're on the newsletter list and we'll have events um, and yeah, just engage with us as much as possible. Um, 
Okay, maybe just a, maybe a couple more here. Um, I've seen it. Okay, wow, getting some technical ones. I've seen a lot of black rot on my um, on my vegetables. Um, so in the last few years, is that a problem or just wet spring summer? Um, so potentially like um, brassicas and um, yeah, broccoli. Um, anybody? I know I know you've probably all seen diseases and pests in your life in your lifetime in your experience on farms. Um, can anybody relate to black rot? <laughs> I can definitely relate to black rot on brassica crops. I wonder about uh, Amy and Danielle also. Um, over the last few years, I've seen that rising. I think that's been a problem in Southern states for a lot longer. Um, and I don't know, I wonder if uh, climate change has anything to do with it. Um, it's a bacterial disease, so it's also not terribly easy to address. Um, and I can't say that I've figured out a solution for sure, but because um, even our fairly extensive crop rotation has not allowed us to completely avoid black rot, um, choosing specifically choosing resistant varieties has been the best um, has been the best effect for me. Um, and then I'm also I would be really careful about how I composted any any product that that had black rot. Um, you guys have other thoughts on that? Oh, I, I, I don't plant a ton of um, brassicas as cover crops for that very reason, just to try not try to not extend the cycle and, and to be able to have more effective crop rotations. Um, I plant some, but that's been a consideration. Yeah, that's a bummer to hear that even Tim with 10 year or four year rotations sees it because I think rotation is the best way to combat that. But I think um, with the crazy weird temperature fluctuations and these periods of super high humidity at the wrong exact times, it's just going to be something we deal with. And, um, you know, for commercial growers, that's very unfortunate because resting from just taking brassicas out of the equation for a year or two would be very, very hard. Um, but yeah, I, I would just echo all the things that Tim said um, in terms of prevention, um, but any diseases, I mean, keeping the plants as dry as you can is important. Rotation, spacing, making sure they have airflow around them. Make sure you buy good seed or good uh, nursery stock that's disease-free when you get it is really important. So if you have compromised plants, you might nurse it back to health, but you might introduce a disease. So just be careful with, with what you're um, what you're, what you're planting initially. Um, yeah, um, is for those of you that have pollinator, pollinator strips, um, or, or even, yeah, almost like permaculture style stuff going on as well, it was like, um, fruit trees and nuts <laughs> and rain gardens. Um, do you, do you see it affect your, your produce? Like, um, and maybe also like, do you see like, like increased insect activity? Um, that look like? I've always had them, so I don't know the, what, what, without them, so I can't really <laughs> answer that question. <laughs> so they've always been there, so yeah, yeah, I don't know, Amy, Tim. I measure mine. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Lots <laughs> of different stuff at different times. I think the um, thing that's most impactful is always just the soil health and then the um, uh, nutrient management. If we hit that right, then it's like a dramatic difference. I mean, we always have um, bees and insects and things. We, we'd like to be more deliberate. And um, with our first few years, we planted lots of perennials that got out of control. And year maybe six, seven, eight, nine, somewhere in there, had to tarp a bunch of stuff. And I think we're ready to get back to it. We still have borders borders and stuff, but in terms of strips in the fields, we don't have that now, but we've always had beehives and things. So pollination hasn't been a problem, but in terms of just bigger, healthier harvests, I think soil health is the first thing um, that we just can see discernible differences. Yeah. We don't have strips per se. The whole, the whole garden area is kind of just intermingled with all kinds of habitat and flowering plants and, and everything. Um, 
and you know, I know that it that it helps. We we get to observe firsthand often the kind of parasitization or predation of some of the the pest species. And I think, I mean, one of the things that I've learned, um, you know, from experience, but also from reading a bit about it, is it's it's kind of consoling to me in a way. Um, to have all these ben these insects that are beneficial, you have to have some around that are the so-called bad guys or the pests. If you have zero, if you use some method to get yourself to zero, it doesn't work because then the other ones don't want to stay around. So there's some kind of base le le level um, of the prey that needs to be around. But yeah, we certainly have insect activity off the charts, um, including lots of beneficial and, and neutrals. So. All right. Um, okay. Maybe maybe one more question. I got in the, the chat here. Um, Tim, you had a fig tree in one of your pictures. Um, do you have that planted outside? Um, do you protect it in the wintertime? Yeah, it's just an experiment. It's it's one of the more cold hardy varieties. Uh, so far, I haven't found that the top will live through our winter, um, but the roots live and it regrows and it it they bear on on first year wood. So you can get a few fruit. Um, this winter I half-heartedly um, tried to protect it. I, oh, actually I did a decent job, I just did it too late. So it's it's my goal to, you know, next time around to actually get it protected, um, surrounded by a cage with leaves and some tar paper to have it shed water so it's not real wet all winter. It's either it'll kind of be bad for it if it is and they're from Mediterranean climate too. So the the dry would not uh, be bad for it. So maybe um, after next winter, I'll be able to report back on whether I can get any of the top to live um, through the winter. Great. All right, well, thank you um, to the three of you, Amy, Tim, and Danielle, um, and all the growers that have worked with the SWCD. Um, and yeah, just continue to reach out um, and keep working together. So thank you. Um, John, I'll send it back to you for... Yeah. Thanks. Thanks very much. And thanks to all the panelists. That was great. And while I'm um, bringing up my screen here, um, just make sure you go on our, our website and uh, sign up for our newsletter and our mailing list to uh, get notice of any, any sort of workshops. We also do accept donations that are tax deductible and you can donate through our, our website as well. Um, and I will, I'm just going to scroll down this way. Okay. Um, door prizes. We have, we have a total of five door prizes to give out real quick. And um, then I'm going to let Maggie uh, close the, the meeting. So we had a total of 76 registrants for the meeting. And what we do is we give each registrant a number and then we um, put those in a hat. And so we have, there, there are four, uh, uh, gift cards to Indie Urban Acres for their upcoming native spring native plant sale. And um, the pre-order for that sale starts on March 1st. And the website is iuaplantsale.com. And um, so the, the first uh, four numbers that I pull, and I, I will say your name, and we will get in touch with you via email. Each of these folks will get uh, a, a $25 gift card to buy some native plants from IUA, which are of fantastic quality. So the first uh, winner is Danielle Haven. Dan Danielle, congrats. We will be in touch with you soon with your $25 gift card. And the next winner is uh, number 69, who is Andrea Bobke. Andrea, we will be in touch. And two more to go. And then we've got the book that we're also going to give away. The next winning number is number 36, which is Chris Jolivet. Congratulations, Chris. And then this is the fourth um, gift card here. Uh, number 76, which is Rick Bine. Congratulations, Rick. And then lastly, we'll do the, uh, the, the book. Oh, and I meant to, while this was going on, I meant to do the drum roll. I, uh, sorry, the, the, the 
it didn't scroll up there. Drum roll, please, for the book uh, that is the No-Till Guide uh, book is number, actually, number 41, uh, which is Mistress Mary. Um, that must be some sort of code name or something, but uh, we will reach out to that email address associated with that that number. That's funny. When I was making that list, I knew that was that could be a winner. Anyway, um, on that note, I'm going to turn it over to Maggie Gagline to send us off. This is our staff, um, and we thank you so much for attending, and I'll, I'll just kick it over to Maggie for one last word, and thanks again. Thank you, John. Um, congratulations to all the door prize winners. Um, I just wanted to say a couple quick thank yous. Um, we have a great team, great staff. John, um, you know, really takes the lead and, and provides uh, the entire team with, with everything that they need, makes our job as board supervisors super easy. So can't thank you all enough um, to the entire team. We're excited to have Elena come back uh, as well once she's off maternity leave. Um, but definitely big thank you to all of you guys for all the hard work that you put in. I also wanted to say thank you to the, um, the entire board of supervisors. Um, in particular, I wanted to thank Tyler and Olivia uh, as our new members and also for the leadership they showed this year in taking over the uh, um, election committee and uh, taking on that role as our treasurer. So Thank you to both of you, and we're so happy to have you um, as part of our, our board. I wanted to also thank our associate um, board supervisors. So if anyone is interested in potentially serving, you can kind of dip your toe into the waters by being an associate. Um, uh, certainly reach out and let us know if you're interested um, for either um, putting your name in the hat um, for a full supervisor role or as an associate. Um, I also wanted to just add my thanks. Um, John had mentioned earlier, so many of our partners and funders, um, you're just vital, of course, to the work of the district. So thank you so much for all of the support. Um, and then to all of you guys, as I'm looking, uh, unfortunately I can't see faces and we're still in a virtual format, but so many familiar names. Um, so whether you come every year or whether this is the first time you've, you've attended one of our annual meetings, um, we're just really happy to have you please feel free. Um, all of our board meetings are public. Um, and so you're welcome to come and just pop in and see how things are going any other time of the year as well. But with that, I'll let you guys get back to your Tuesday evening. Um, thank you so much. And I hope everybody has a healthy, happy, safe 2022. And we'll see you next year.